Perfect. So let me start with uh, thanking the organizers and the framework in mind for putting together what I consider as a very interesting step forward in the endeavor of exploring double copy related topics. So the title is actually, I think, chosen very timely because I don't know of any other subject in theoretical particle physics widely defined which has the same number of different approaches and languages in which the double copy expresses itself uh, i will as the first speaker of this conference take a couple of minutes more a couple being maybe two or three for a little more extended introduction, which will outline many of the languages and maybe connect them already a little. The title of my talk is Double Copy Reversed, a multi regger example. And that already contains two topics, which usually you would not in the slightest sense actually connect as a particle physicist. Both topics could occur at an amplitudes conference. Nevertheless, the multi regger regime of scattering would probably not make contact with the double copy. This is a work in progress with my master student, Konstantin Baumann, who actually did most of the heavy calculational work on this project. So let's get started right away. We're building the Tower of Babel, bringing together various languages of color kinematics duality. That is what this conference is about. And widely defined, the situation is that we are always considering a physics theory, which usually is a gauge theory, and then we double copy it in some way to get a gravitational theory. Now, these notions are rather unsharp, and I will make an effort to be a little more precise. But as the name says, double copy is always something where we take the same theory, and it can be also different theories later on, and combine them in some way, which might be some squaring or some combinatorical squaring algorithm, and then obtain observables of another theory, which I will, for the for simplicity, call a gravitational theory. And in this approach or in this description, we have the problem and the chance at the same time. We have an amazingly wide range of languages. And if we are talking about a theory, then there is always a certain subset of the theory which might be an observable, which might be the Lagrangian description, which might be uh, some canon canonical correlator or something which defines the theory. And for these objects, one can then ask in what way they can be combined, means double copied, in order to get a gravitational theory. And the approaches we are going to be talking about in this conference, they are uh, in various mathematical languages, it's algebraic approaches, it is analytic approaches, and it's also geometric approaches. And there's, of course, a huge number of theories which are related. So historically, how it started was that the amplitude approach was maybe explored thoroughly and put together in the famous 08053993 paper by Bern Carrasco and Johansson. And the basic idea was in the Feynman integral language that once one was able to rewrite the theory or the Feynman rules in terms of cubic graphs, that is graphs with only three vertex interactions, one could define an object which is called a numerator that is this part of the amplitude where one has the propagators or the poles of the amplitude factored out. And what they recognized is that if you take a gauge theory, let's think about Young-Mills theory for the moment, and or even any Kofosov Young-Mills theory for the moment, if you 
take two copies and combine them with a graphical approach, then you could get the amplitudes for n equal eight supergravity. And this approach does not only work at tree level, but it is has been extended during the last, by now it's 14 years since this article was published, to loop level and most of the very successful results for calculations, amplitude calculations in n equal eight supergravity, go back to this initial idea. So the techniques to mention here are that one can start to find these numerators with large ansatz, then perform a cut verification, which makes reference to the unitarity of the problem. And there's a lot of graph combinatorics involved. And this means, on the other hand, that this is based on the Feynman approach. So the amplitude approach is Feynman graph based. And of course, the most famous result, the five loop calculation in n equal eight supergravity was something which was a milestone uh, which was reached with that kind of approach. But soon, once one recognized the um, the equality of the language used for the color algebra in the gauge theory and the three vertex representation of graphs came across the idea of a kinematical algebra. So what one wanted to do is one wanted to build numerators from some structure constants. So I've written down um, a graph here. Can you see my pointer? Okay. Yes. Um, so let's take a certain five point graph, which has certain labels, A, B, C, D, and E. And then in the same way as you would assign color structure constants to each of the three valent vertices, you could also think about doing that in a kinematical way. That is, one wanted to have an algebraic approach by assigning a kinematical factor to each of these three valent vertices. Now, this has been a long history of discussion and it works flawlessly as long as you stay in the self-dual sector or the MHV sector of uh, gauge theory, but numerous extensions deviating from the MHV sector are known. And in particular, we will hear, hear about quite a number of the extensions during the next couple of days. So for example, these kinematical algebras, they do exist for some theories, including massive particles, and one knows for a particular extension to next to MHV or even higher MHV sectors, how these things actually work. Now, immediately, if you think about connecting observables, comes across the question of, and double copy formalism at the Lagrangian level. And it turns out that there is two directions one should actually think about. So there is the uh, idea to write a Lagrangian, which upon application of according Feynman rules will produce color kinematic satisfying representations that is valid numerators in the language I mentioned before. This works order by order. There were uh, early attempts by Kiermaier and Bern and later Weinzel and Tolotti managed to uh, streamline that formalism. And it's also part of the next point I'd like to mention. There's the homotopy Lie algebra approach in which one can describe a gauge theory in uh, by using the basically the ideas from the batalin wilkowski formalism and using an algorithm to introduce auxiliary fields. I'm sure Leron Boston is going to tell something in an hour from now. But these homotopy Lie algebras, they provide a beautiful framework to again get something which is akin to the cubic representations of the Feynman graphs I mentioned before. And then double copy can be realized at an operator level for these algebras. That is what I would consider as one of the most interesting and formal 
developments during the last two or three years if it comes to, this, to the description of color kinematics duality. Whatever I've been mentioning right now was something which had a certain direction. It always started with a gauge theory or an observable gauge theory, an amplitude in gauge theory, and then would, in some sense, at the beginning, even empirically, try to combine these observables, amplitudes, or objects in a meaningful way. And then people recognized that there is a closed expression or a gravitational expression, which those uh, open amplitudes or gauge theory amplitudes close into. That is, the direction of recognizing the double copy was always from the uh, gauge theory side, from the object or the theory, you would plug into the double copy in order to get something which is then a closed amplitude or a gravitational amplitude. Very early on, it was recognized that these famous KLT relations, the Kawai, the Venom, and Tai relations, they would do something very similar compared to what Ben Carrasco and Johansson recognized for the gauge theory amplitudes for string theory. So here, you would have open string theory and combine n open string amplitude with another open string amplitude, and you will get closed string amplitude. And if you consider the original paper from Kawai, Lavelle, and Tai, then the most remarkable fact here is that they did not consider open string amplitudes and combine them in some way to get closed string amplitudes, but they did it the other way around. Kawai, Lavelle, and Tai started with an integral defined on the Riemann sphere, which is the right manifold for a closed string amplitude, and then managed with a series of transformations, substitutions, and analytical considerations to break this integral apart into what is now two factors of open string amplitudes. And it turns out that for almost all double copies which are known that these KLT relations do contain the quantum field theory double copies, and the playground where one could explore the analytical properties of that double copy was the so-called string corrections. And I've written down here an example. So if you combine what is the correction, the string correction for an open string amplitude, so the one minus zeta two, uh, some Mandelstam variables plus zeta three with some Mandelstam variables, and each Mandelstam variable is defined here to contain a factor of the uh, string ordering parameter or the inverse string tension alpha prime. If you would combine them with a compensating factor of sine of pi s12 of one Mandelstam variable, you would get the string corrected or the string correction for a closed string amplitude. And what is remarkable, and that was recognized first in a paper by Stefan Stieberger and then uh, done explicitly by uh, Braun and Dupont in the fall of 2019, that the zeta values which appear here are so-called single valued zeta uh, values, while the one in the two open string amplitudes, which are just multiplied here, are general multiple zeta values. And that is the defining and most general concept I want to use as a starting point today. It seems that the functions for a gravitational amplitude or a closed string amplitude are of a certain kind. There are single valued functions, single valued numbers. One has to be very careful with defining what a single valued number means. But uh, in the context, I will use it later on, it is so-called single-valued polylogarithms, that is polylogarithms which do not have any branch cuts on the Riemann sphere. On the disk, that is the natural environment for the open string factor, uh, amplitude, there will be polylogarithms which have branch cuts. 
So one can think about that KLT relation also in a very geometrical way. So I've been drawing here two disks, which I deformed a little in order to look like, like half spheres. And you can see open string insertion points here along the boundary of one disk. And then there's the mirror disk with the according insertion points. And you can actually put those together and define the closed string amplitude. So I want to understand double copy in a geometric way by combining two half spheres with appropriate positions of the uh, particles or vertex operators in that particular string theory. And that picture should not be confined to string theory only, but it will be something which will also explain and be an amazing laboratory for quantum field theory. Now, I called the talk a reversed approach, and I already mentioned that the Kawai, Lavelle, and Tai approach starts from an integral on the Riemann sphere and breaks it apart in a product of integrals of the um, on the disks. So. Having this geometrical interpretation, one very fastly uh, gets into a regime where mathematics really hits. And one topic one really needs to mention in what is now a little beyond an introduction, but still I'm about to mention some of the effects which might occur later in this conference, one has to think about so-called quadratic relations. So quadratic relations is something which is in, in investigated usually in algebraic geometry. And what I've wrote down is the famous so-called Legendre relation. That is a relation you can substantiate with integrals, period integrals defined on a genus one Riemann surface. And while omega one and omega two are the so-called periods and eta one and eta two are the so-called quasi periods, both of which you can represent as integrals along a closed cycle on the surface in question. If you combine them in the way I wrote down here, then you get a number, 2 pi i. And this number 2 pi i can, of course, be beautifully represented as an integral on the closed genus 0 surface as an integral on the Riemann sphere. That is, if you consider these periods and quasi-periods as period, period integrals, and in that sense, as something which is very similar to an observable, that is an amplitude, for example, where you have to integrate only once, then you would have a certain amplitude here, a certain open amplitude, that is something which is integrated along a boundary. You multiply them and you take a sum and multiply two other amplitudes and you get something which is fully symmetric. It's a number, after all, which is naturally defined on the full Riemann sphere. So this quadratic relation, this Legendre relation, is something which is not only very similar, but could be considered as one of the most simple implementations of a KLT or a double copy relation for an admittedly simple object on a genus one surface. And once you entered the idea of representing objects and observables in this theory as integrals over a certain surface or the cycle of a certain surface, then you enter the realm of monotomy relations and monotomy relations they will give you relations between certain amplitudes. And it's actually true that uh, all the so-called BCJ relations can be derived from considering amplitudes or considering a complex plane and certain representations of amplitudes and deriving these monotony relations. That was a little bit fast. I already mentioned this Legendre relation as a double copy for numbers. So double copy for numbers is perfectly understood. Uh, of course, it is only a valid approach if you consider numbers 
as results from so-called period intervals. So what is an amplitude? An amplitude is, of course, a functional of the Mandelstam variables. But in some sense, you could also consider that these Mandelstam variables as some fixed auxiliary variables, and then consider the amplitude as a period integral, which can be, once you choose a particular constellation for your external momenta, can be converted into a number. And it turns out that the integral definitions of so-called multiple zeta values, that is, there we have zeta 2 and zeta 3, but in the open string, there is also more zeta 3.5 or even longer zeta values, they can be represented as integrals on a disk. And there is another version, so-called single-valued multiple zeta values, and they can be represented in simple situations as integrals on the Riemann sphere. Probably that's also possible for not so simple situations, but this is not for now. So we have a double copy for numbers once we consider these numbers as period integrals. And the last thing in what is now a little more than an introduction I want to mention is the classical solution double copy. And from a mathematical point of view, this is a double copy for vector fields, both of which are defined on a sphere, and then one needs some consistency condi conditions to combine them into, say, vector fields, which describe something in a gravitational theory from something which might be just electromagnetism. And uh, that is something I will not go into, but I want to mention it because that is mathematically a lot more involved than just period integrals and numbers, but it might also be very constraining. So the approach during this talk is that I'd like to mention that most amplitudes in gauge theories are polylogarithms. Uh, that's certainly true. And special values of polylogarithms are multiple zeta values. And most amplitudes on the other side of the double coupling relations or gravitational theory, uh, that is uh, functions in which you express the result for a gravitational theory are single valued polylogarithms. And they have as special values the single valued multiple zeta values. So polylogarithms is something everybody will know, and single valued polylogarithms are just linear combinations of usual polylogarithms which don't have branch cuts on the Riemann sphere. And the central question, which is the starting point for the reversed double copy, is the following. Given a theory producing single-valued objects only, that is, single-valued polylogs or single-valued multiple zeta values, can one factorize this theory into two open theories or two copies? And the uh, question can be made a little more precise by putting the always in here. But the always uh, has a question mark, and I will not deliver an answer to that question. And I think it's one of the most uh, difficult questions in the double copy world and business. But instead, I will do, I will, I will consider a uh, multi register theory, which will be decomposable into two copies of another theory, which I will specify. And in order to see that approach and see what one can do with that multi register remainder function theory, let me very briefly on two slides review what Kawai and Levan and Tai did for the string theory tree level. So, we have an open string amplitude, and I was a little fishy here by intention, of course. These open string integrals, they can be represented as iterated integrals over what is called the Kobanitsyn factor. And for simplicity, let's assume that the positions of the vertex operators are real. That is, we use the transformation to put all the, the Möbius transformation to put all the insertion points on the real line. And this is just the distance I, uh, which is taken to the power of the uh, 
according one is done momentum here. It is an iterated integral. So this succession here really translates into the condition that x1 shall be the smallest value and xn minus one where n is the number of external legs should be placed at one. And then there's all these considerations of fixing three points on the sphere, uh, which goes into that. But I want to point out this particular form, which is like the green function for an open string here. It has just two, the difference of two real values, two real insertion points taken to the power of the according Mandelstam level. And if writing down the closed analog thereof, one will have integrations over the Riemann sphere, multiple integrations over the Riemann sphere, but there is no ordering prescription on the Riemann sphere. So it is just a product of the integrals. But the Kovanielsen factor now is for complex insertion points Z, something which goes along with the holomorphic part of Z or the difference of the holomorphic part of Z taken to the um, to the complex conjugate, uh, I shouldn't have said holomorphic, which takes just the difference between the two z's and then takes the com complex conjugate of the difference taken to the same Mandelstam level. And that already looks very much like a double copy. So we have one object which is comparable to each of these two objects here. And the uh, uh, result from where Kawai and Laval and Tai was that they really took each of those integrations and were able to write it as a product of integrals with some new variables xi and eta and the function f of xi and eta where all the combinatorics is in there. The idea is a contour deformation in the complex plane and a clever uh, substitution for the variables which makes these integrals factorize. That might be better visible if you write down a string example. So there is a sign function here again, and then we have two open string uh, amplitudes and that closes into the closed string amplitude and written as the ratio of gamma functions for the Veneziano and the Virasor Shapiro amplitude, you can write, write it in the following way. You have a certain ratio of gamma functions, which once you apply the formula above, and that is only written down for the string correction, will result in this ratio of gamma functions. Or if you rather want an integral, then this would be the right one. It's an Euler beta function, which actually closes into a ratio of Euler beta functions, which are uh, integrated over the complex projective plane, which is nothing else than the Riemann sphere. So here we have a mathematically very clear uh, outline, and this is well explored and might be the cleanest version of a double copy. So for the actual content of the project I want to report on, we have been looking at the so-called remainder function in multi regikin metrics. So we are considering scattering in any young mills theory. And in any young mills theory, there is the so-called BDS ansatz, where BDS is for Bern, Dixon, and Smirnov. And these three gentlemen managed to write down a general ansatz for loop amplitudes in any Gefosse-Boyer-Mills theory. Any Gefosse-Boyer-Mills theory is a very symmetric theory. So if at any place, if not there, uh, you would expect some closed ansatz or some nice form, then uh, any Gefosse-Boyer-Mills theory, theory is the theory you want to look at. And it turned out that hopes have been just a little too high. This BDS ansatz, so that's loop amplitudes, with n external lags that had to be corrected by uh, the so-called remainder function. The remainder function is called R for remainder, and it enters the ansatz with an exponential of that remainder function. And basically the existence goes back 
to the ability of building so-called conformal cross ratios, which only appears to be non-trivial at six points. That is the simplest remainder function one knows is for six points scattering in any of four super young mills. So for four points or four and R5 or zero, while R6 is the uh, first non-zero contribution. And in what remains from this talk, I will focus on R6 exclusively because R6 is the simplest non-trivial object and it's actually, as we will see, very analogous to the four-point closed string amplitude. So what do we need for this calculation? I will not explain that in detail because that is a calculationally very um, cumbersome regime. So the multi-retro regime is a particular scattering regime where you have almost no transversal momenta. That is, once you have two incoming uh, particles, they will either be repelled or they will almost not interact. That is, the transversal momenta going up and down will be negligible, but not zero. And it was recognized very early on that this kind of scattering would be governed by the so-called BFKL equation. The buzzword here is Pomeron scattering. And uh, this BFKL equation, there's a long line of arguments that it contributes to the multi retro regime. It actually gives the result for the remainder function. But what we will need from this differential equation is that it has so-called eigenvalues. They are expressed in some uh, as functions of some variables nu and n, and we have an impact factor, which is basically an eigenfunction of this BFKL operator. And then one has to continue analytically in order to get an interesting result, but that's beyond of what I want to tell. What I want to show you instead is that this whole calculation is a terrible calculation. So the exponential of this six point remainder function in multi retro kinematics, together with some analytical continuation pull here, can be written as a sum. So there's a constant term, let's forget about that term for the moment. Uh, can be written as a sum, an infinite sum for minus infinity plus infinity times an integral and the two variables which is summed over is n and nu. And then follows a large integrand here which contains these eigenfunctions and the eigenvalue of the BFKL operator. And the only remaining quantities here is kinematical quantities. So in the multi retro regime, one can specify kinematics for six points with three variables, u1, u2, and u3. And u2 and u3 can be combined into w and w star. So the takeaway message here is that u1 and w and w star, where it occurs up here, is precisely the kinematical variables. Now, this is very complicated, and there have been many contributions to settling and breaking down this complication. Most of the approaches, they defined an integral expression i, which contains precisely the sum and the integral and puts all the dirty BFKL expansion into a function f. And if one can integrate this well-behaved function f, then one is done. If one does the calculation, and a lot of effort has been done, then one recognizes there is the single value to polylogarithms exclusively paired with the single valued MZ loops. So this particular remainder function seems to originate in a theory which in nature is really a gravitational theory or a theory which is defined on the Riemann sphere. And that was the starting point for this uh, project together with Konstantin, where we have asked ourselves the question the question, can we take this expression here and really break it apart into two open-like integrals? And it turns out that this is possible. So in the original 
expression, we had a sum and an integral. And the first step was to take this sum, which is a sum over residues of certain poles, and rewrite that as an integral. And in fact, one actually searches for a function f, depending on the two variables, uh, z and nu, uh, which once integrated from minus infinity to plus infinity will just reproduce the sum by using Cauchy's theorem. One has to think about how this function f is allowed to be, that this is an identity. But Konstantin, uh, during the last three months, managed to actually find such a function, which then, after a little more research, was identified as some type of the so-called sommerfeld watson transformation. It turns out that for the op following the definition up here, one can write this function f of z and nu as some hyperbolic cosine with a clever variable redefinition, which I wrote down here. Now the kinematics is expressed in the variable phi. And while it is very easy to write that on here, uh, the slide, it means that one has to carefully sum up an infinite number of poles and make sure that the function has a support which is compact enough to actually have the integration contour vanish at infinity. And there is an infinite number of poles on the imaginary axis and two poles in the lower complex plane, rather technical, but the punchline is one can write it as a double integral. So that's already quite a step forward. And here we get to something which is very similar to Kawai, Levelle's, and Tai's starting point. Now, factorization is, of course, not immediate and also not easy to see because this function f could be or does depend on the integration variable nu and on the integration variable z, then uh, the things are coupled in that uh, denominator here. And there is a lot of questions one needs to ask what to do in order to decouple that. And for this talk, I just want to mention that one has to use a combination of gamma function and Euler beta function identities and also some properties of the hyperbolic cosine and uh, some variable the definitions. So the full toolbox of uh, complex analysis uh, aficionado. And once one does that, in fact, one will get an integral which is not yet decoupled, but looks already beautifully closer to something which can be decoupled. So we have w and w star, which are taken to the power of xi plus and xi minus. This xi plus and xi minus could be something like the z and z bar for the complex plane. And then there's a large ratio of gamma functions and some term where one has to swap w and w star and a single pole term, which is a constant curl. Now, of course, I wouldn't be giving this talk if the integrations could not actually be separated. So there's a further substitution. One basically does a rotation in the complex plane. And it turns out that one can write this whole integral in terms of the, in terms of an integral over two copies of the inverse Mellin transform of this initial function f. So that was a little too much information in one sentence. So let me break things apart. So this function f, which is the integral function, that can be broken apart into, into, <laughs> into factors which depend just on chi plus and chi minus. These are the factors fi and gi, and there will be several of them. Just as in a double copy thing, usually one has uh, sums 
of products of the observables in the open theorem. And it turns out once you apply an inverse Mellon transform together with an auxiliary parameter u over these functions, then you get something which really looks uh, uh, as simple amplitudes or objects or observables in a theory which doesn't know about the other copy of the theory. So we have one inverse Mellon transform and the second inverse Mellon transform, one goes with W, one goes with W star. And what was what used to be the sign factor is now an integral over the auxiliary parameter u. So we are there, but not quite, or it is a simply a little different. It is not that it is just a product, but it is an integral over the product of these uh, inverse Mellon transforms. Uh, I've written down what the inverse Mellon transform at a particular place x is for a function. Uh, here, in our case, the c constant, which should be close to zero, is a quarter. And uh, that will allow to bring the uh, functions into this particular form. Now, one can do even a little better. And I was actually very happy when Konstantin showed up with this uh, result uh, after the previous one was already beautiful. Uh, one can write it very much in a way as polylogarithms are written usually. So the argument of the iterated integral is, is W. W will be uh, was the kinematical invariant, which we wanted to use for the expression. And now one does a couple of further manifestations. But what is important is that now the integration is just over u plus 1, which is precisely the integration kernel you would need for a polylogarithm. And that will make the evaluation analytically and beautiful. So the smiley face down here tells you that this is really something we didn't expect at the beginning. So it is an example of a theory which whose results look like a gravitational theory and which at the very end leads to something which can be represented as the product of two open string-like or gauge theory-like amplitudes. Now, let me conclude. How much time is left for me? About 10 minutes? 10 minutes, yeah. Okay. yeah. That's perfect. Um, so what was the, the starting point here? So we uh, got started with the original KLT approach, which was as early as 1986. And we asked ourselves, what is the mathematical condition for being able to break a theory apart into two factors? And while this is a question we could not answer, it was more an experimental endeavor to take this theory, this multi ratchet kinematical theory, and break it apart because it was expressed in terms of single valued objects only. And it turns out that in this case, this pure recognition of having single valued polylogs and single valued objects was enough to, uh, uh, as a starting point. I should mention and should make very clear that this approach is in no way guaranteed to work. So. In that respect, it is an empiric result, which can be substantiated analytically. So each of the transformations we did, which are sometimes not even nice, can be proven to be correct. But it is not the case that once you hand me another theory or another calculation producing just single valued objects, that then I would sign a paper saying, ah, this can for sure be broken apart into open 
objects or gauge theory objects, which uh, can be expressed in terms of polylogarithms, uh, which are not single band. So no statement here about the always in my initial question. Another point, what is different, I mentioned it already, is that while we have the, uh, in the KLT relation, just a product over the open string function, here it is the case that these open parts are connected by an integration. So it might be the case that for KLT, because KLT is so simple and so mathematically clean, the uh, integration just decouples and the integrand does not uh, contain the, the open string parts. That is actually the case because the sign can be written as a product of gamma functions. This is not the case here. So here the integration has to stay as it is. And I would believe that this is actually a common feature of these uh, endeavors to break apart single value theories. So it is rather the case that for KLT, the sign factor is something which is a miracle or a very simple factor, while this integral is probably the thing one should expect in a general scenario. Now, this function R6 is really the most simple function you can think of in the multi regular regime. And one needs to formulate this for higher points. One will face heavy combinatorics, which in the situation of complex calculus in different variables will have its very own problems. So it is very tough of course, to take limits or variable transformations with uh, various complex variables, in particular, when you want to change the succession of integration, you will get all types of monotomy factors. This is not going to be nice, but I believe it's actually worth to do it because there are lots of results actually in principle to any number of points and any order in the expansion in one of the kinematic variables available from an approach by Claude Boer and collaborators based on the so-called Bizet Edenstahl-Stahlbacher kernel. I'll get back to that in a minute. First, I'd like to ask, was that a surprise? Or differently, how did we get across that question initially? It turns out that once you consider points higher than six, the expression gets a little more cumbersome and it contains something which is called a central emission vertex. This is a function of four variables. Again, there is integer variables n and m where there's a sum over and then there's new and new where you have an integral. Now you are having four integrals. But if you consider this ratio of gamma functions together with some, the fact that n and m show up here, and here it's the difference of m and n, then this is very similar to the open string closed four point amplitude. So let me go back to that for a short moment. So with a little work, you can actually show that the central emission vertex is very similar in shape. And once you have a closer look to the arguments, even in the choice of arguments to this open string four point function. So this open string four point function seems to be a seed for the further integration, which will then produce single valued objects. So I wrote it in words again. It's very similar to the four-point open string amplitude. So the answer to the question, was that a surprise, is clearly no. That hasn't been a surprise at all. Because all objects, in order to calculate this closed amplitude or these remainder functions, would be something which is very similar to the closed amplitude. Now, 
What's next? The remainder functions can be calculated based on some matrix operations to any order, any number of legs. But if that is so similar to the closed string amplitudes on a sphere, then this would possibly be a way to find a recursive algorithm which is in concordance with those matrix calculations and allows a recursive calculation of closed string amplitudes. And that is something which is not available right now. There is a recursive calculation for open string amplitudes or gauge theory amplitudes. But for closed objects, there is maybe some formula for very simple scenarios, but not for a general function on a Riemann sphere with marked points. So what we see here is a very interesting convergence of very different concepts from very different corners of the uh, theoretical structural uh, particle physics world. And I would like to invite you, once we are ready with writing down this paper, to look at it and maybe one can recognize even further structures and connections to other theories which start from the same question. We have a theory which looks like a gravitational theory that is only a single valued object. Can we find further examples to break that apart in a meaningful way? Thank you Thank very you much, much, Johannes. It was a very, very interesting talk with a novel perspective on double copy. I have a question. So you showed that uh, um, yang mills theory, super yang mills theory in this particular kinematic regime behaves like gravity in the sense that it displays this double copy property to produce single value for logarithmic objects. Is there a deep reason for this or is it just um, computational evidence? Can you say again what you are after? That is, if you need a deep reason for, for what? Yeah. For the single we have kind or? of uh, Yang, -Mil, Yang Mills that behaves like gravity in the sense that produce uh, a single value for the logarithmic objects. We can realize it as a double copy of something. So in that sense, it behaves in that multi-regio regime like gravity. Is this something just like uh, empirical observation or? So for, for the physics of the multi regime, there is a good argument. So uh, in order for a short answer, a, a nice explanation is, for example, in the article 12070186 from Duart Dixon and Pennington. Um, there's a good argument. I see. Why there is uh, it seems to be a general truth that all gravitational objects come with Johannes. Sorry, Johannes, you are apparently frozen, I think. Uh, 